Hmm. Hello, my lovely people, and welcome to Owen's Mind, a light-hearted trip through the contents of my head and the world in general. It is Saturday the 28th of March. My name is Owen, and here is what is on my mind today. So, hopefully you're all keeping well. Hopefully, you know, this horrible virus thing has not affected you in a negative way too much. Um, UK is obviously still very much on lockdown. I've tried to, what I've tried to do for myself personally is give my days a little bit more structure because for the first couple of days it was great. I just don't, don't have to get up early and go to work. I can chill out, I can watch TV. But I found for me that wore out pretty quickly and I was like, eh, let's just eat again to pass the time. So I've tried to give my life a little bit of structure now. So I've got a little schedule I follow so I can work out in the morning and, and you know, scheduling some meals and scheduling some videos and bits and pieces like this. And it's just going to give my day more of a, a kind of structured feel to pass the time. So that's it. Hope you're, you've are you got a similar thing. Hope it's not driving you too crazy. Hope you're not stuck in a house with somebody you're not really getting on with. Hope everything's well. A little bit of unity at this time. Good stuff. Anyway, as always, I've picked out five stories making the headlines of what to give my thoughts on. Links will be in the description below so you can read each article in full and show those original publications some love. So without any further ado, let's get into story number one. And story number one today comes from BBC News. Coronavirus again. I know it's, it's all over the headlines. I can't avoid it. So there's going to be some stories. But I've tried to find some more positive spins on it. Retired police officers will jump at a return to the force. So, yeah, um, retired police officers say thousands of former colleagues would be willing to rejoin the force and help the country cope with the virus. Uh, home office figures show about 22,000 police officers in England and Wales retired over the past five years. And uh, the Metropolitan Police is already asking retirees to come back. Uh, so former Chief Superintendent uh, Cool Mahay said many officers would jump at the chance to help people feel safe. Uh, the National Police Chiefs Council in uh, PCC said it was working with the government to facilitate the return of recently retired officers depending on local needs. This would exclude anybody who was um, left on uh, medical ground, resigned, transferred or were, were dismissed. So there is rules, but generally, you know, they're hoping people will step up and come back. Uh, so uh, Mr. Mahay, um retired from the Derbyshire Council Constabulary in 2015, said the police need to help people feel safe. He said, I think for most uh, part retired officers will jump at the challenge because you see it as a vocation. As for me, it was a dream at the age of 10 to be a police officer. You know, so a lot of officers, you know, they don't do it for the paycheck. They do it because they want to keep the public safe and, you know, uphold the law and, and serve the community. And this is an opportunity for them to do that. He said, um, retired officers have a lot of experience they could bring a lot back to the service, but it was subject for debate whether they should be given full powers. Uh, it's possible we could return to more of a support role to free up uniformed and non-uniformed staff to get out there and maintain order. Um, former Staffordshire Police Chief Constable Jane Sawyer said forces needed to plan for their officers getting coronavirus. Police officers are going to have to self-isolate, so they will be depleted, the 55-year-old said. Meanwhile, there's a lot of calls on the police to deal with lockdown measures so yeah it's because the police are still out there they cannot their job requires them to be in contact with the public and they're upholding the lockdown laws and so many of the things that might go on around this thing just like nhs staff that supermarket staff they are they cannot avoid human contact the way such as i can i can stay in my flat and i'm fine um, so there's a risk that some of these officers are going to get the virus and have to self-isolate, which will drop the numbers. So if the, what they're saying is if any retired officers can come back into the fold and help support numbers and help people in the local communities, that can only be a good thing. Um, apparently the job has changed dramatically within five years in terms of procedures and paperwork, and those officers would have to do more. So that's um, what Jane Sawyer has also added. Um, so yeah, the job has changed in the last five years since a lot of officers retired, but again, if they come in as a support role, just to kind of, you know, assist and, and bolster the numbers, it can only be a good thing. A former police officer, uh, where I lost my thread, oh, Mike Panett said there were many retired colleagues who were as loyal as anything to policing and to the country. The 56-year-old from York, quite close to me, uh, served with both Metropolitan and North Yorkshire forces and said there was still a sense of duty for police officers even after leaving the force. I think there'll be a flood of people, he said, who wanted to rejoin. So this just speaks to the bigger thing at the minute. There is so many people, you know, former nurses and care workers who have retired or left that particular um, service, gone to do other things, 
and they're now saying, you know what, the country needs us, let's come back to it. Let's support our new colleagues and the new people in these roles that we formerly held because they need our help and we understand having done it, just how tough it is, particularly at a time like this. So it is, it's one of the good things to come out of this. If there is little slithers of kind of goodness we can pull from this, because it's a terrible situation, let's face it, but it's nice to be able to focus on, you know what, it's brought out the wonderful spirit of people. And it's all over the world, obviously I'm focused on the UK, but I mean, all over the world this is happening, people are coming back and say, stepping up for their fellow men and women, so. A good positive story, you know, hopefully, again, this is a temporary measure and this will pass. I don't know long time scale wise, um, but yeah, good story, good positive stuff. Positive people want to do positive things for everybody else in society. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. Anyway, let's move on to story number two. So, nice quick one, light one, BuzzFeed News. A bored sports pro broadcaster filmed his dog to racing to eat their breakfast and his commentary is their best thing, and it is. So, click on the site, you'll see, click on the link, you'll see the video. Uh, so, this is Andrew Cotter, who works for BBC Sport, covering major events. Took his boredom and created a video which he commented on his two Labradors, Olive and Mabel, racing to finish their food. The video has all the elements of the big game contest Cotter is best known for, suspense, tactics, and sportsmanship. The video has gone viral with over 500,000 views in less than two hours since it was tweeted. So, yeah, this is a wonderful video. It's about a minute and a half, and it is just him and his two dogs, and he's, um, he's essentially his wife or his partner has some bowls of food, and he's just talking and like they're on the start line. The food goes down, the dogs come charging up, and he commentates on it, and it's just brilliant. It's just a bit of joy in an otherwise miserable time. But one thing it also does is, a lot of times if you watch commentary, if you're watching a sporting event and someone's commentating and they'll say something and it's a bit like, I could do that job. That's easy, just talking about what you see. Try it. Something like this, because again, he, he, it sounds wonderful. It's like, this is all made up on the fly. And it's like, this is a real skill I think you don't give commentators enough credit for. You know, the, their ability to, to, to add um, spectacle audio spectacle to a visual thing like football. I mean, football is, you know, as much as people love football, I'm not a huge fan, but as much as people do, there is long periods of football where it's not the most exciting because it's tactical. And, you know, the same with like boxing, you know, a boxing match that goes a distance because one fighter just keeps away from the other one. Try to commentate on that and keep it exciting for those listening, those maybe listening to a radio broadcast and can't see it visually, is a very difficult skill. And this kind of proves it, because it, this sounds like a sporting event, it's wonderful. So, a lot of people tweeted that it was brilliant, a lot of people are asking for a rematch, because of, I won't tell you which dog won, but one did, um, obviously. Um, some people um, posted videos of their dog as potential contenders, you know, eating their breakfast and that kind of thing. So again, just a little bit of joy, it's brilliant. Do watch it, it's really for me. Moving on to story number three, this is a thing. Uh, this is in the mirror. Sex workers demand the government bail out as coronavirus pandemic hits their takings. So, yeah, sex workers are demanding a bailout from the government after seeing their income plummet because of the coronavirus crisis. The English Collective of Prostitutes, I didn't know that was a thing, based in Kentish Town, London, want the government to recognise thousands of sex workers across the country as employees. Uh, the organisation wants sex workers to be able to access the financial support offered to other employers, uh, employees affected by the COVID-19 pandemic sweep across the world. This is from Birmingham Live. Um, in a statement seen by the website, the group says, much sex work involves personal contact. I would imagine all sex work involves personal contact. Exactly what we're being warned against if the virus is to be contained. The virus comes on top of the crisis of poverty, especially among young women. Uh, most sex workers are mothers, mainly single mothers, who have to have been made poorer by austerity cuts. Figures show one and a half million people have been made destitute by government policies and four million children are living in poverty. Um, and thousands of families in the UK rely on the income from sex work to survive. That's a depressing statistic, isn't it? The group continues, sex workers' income is down and for some women it has almost disappeared. Some women are turning to non-contact forms of sex work like camming where possible, so obviously webcam stuff uh, and probably phone line stuff and, you know, all the non-contact stuff that can be done. Uh, women working on the street, migrant and trans workers who already have the highest rates of poverty, arrest and violence are particularly suffering. Like other workers, we are being forced to choose between earning an income and risking the lives and the lives of our loved ones. Um, contact with health professionals and contact tracing measures are hindered by criminalisation because we can't say what we do or who we know for fear of arrest and discrimination. That's quite a good point, actually, because if, um, 
if they fear they have the virus and then they try to trace, well, who have you been in contact with? There's maybe a, a reluctance there because of what they do, because they may be um, giving the name of somebody who is participating in a criminal act because sex work is still illegal in the UK. Um, we must have access to emergency money. Sex workers are denied states as workers, so we are denied the rights and entitlements that other workers may have. Many of us and the families who depend on our income will face destitution if we can't access whatever emergency money workers win from the government. If sex workers' contribution to the survival and welfare of people was more visible, our status would rise and our demands would be seen as more valid. Um, we need rent, mortgage, utility bill relief and emergency housing for homeless sex workers. The group has been at the heart of a long-running campaign calling for the decriminalisation of sex work and an immediate moratorium on raids, arrests and prosecution. Yeah, so this one this is a mouthful of names and water for this one. This, you can... Some people are going to come at this and say, well, you're doing, what you're doing is illegal, so tough. You don't, you're, not, you're not an employee the way I'm an employee, that kind of thing. Okay, fair enough. But if they have no other choice, if they have no other option, and being this week the government has said that all homeless people have to be housed, you know, we have to give them, a, we have to support them essentially, then take out the fact sex workers, just look at them as these are human beings who need help, just like anybody else does. So you could probably argue, do they need the 80% that some workers are getting, do they need the, the self-employed package that is hopefully in the pipeline to help those people? I don't know. You can argue percentages all you want. But the fact is, the people, the citizens of this country, they need assistance, they should be given assistance. So however you look at it. Um, the whole decriminalisation of sex work, that's a whole different issue and that's not something that they're going to be able to sort in the next couple of days to then say, all right, you're now rubber stamped as an employee, you're self-employed, so you are now entitled to this. And because I don't imagine that they keep kind of employment records and tax records and VAT and all this kind of stuff. So, but yeah, it's just, it's it affects everybody. And regardless of your opinion on their choice of income, they do it because they need, that's how they can pay the bills. For whatever reason, they cannot find um, financial aid elsewhere. They cannot get a job elsewhere for whatever reason. So this is how they make the money. And again, a lot of them is for, to support families. It's not just for them. It's certainly, I imagine for a lot of them, not a, a career they choose. It's one they've fallen into or been forced into or for whatever reason. Um, so yeah, they should get help like everybody should get help. Um, like I say, you can argue percentages, you can argue uh, well, they don't deserve self-employed status, or they don't deserve the 80%, this, that, and the other, but they deserve help because everybody deserves help. Um, so, yeah, we'll see going forward. Hopefully everybody will um, get some assistance so they don't lose houses and, you know, that nobody goes hungry and that kind of thing. But, it's again, it's an unprecedented times. I know they keep saying it on the news. This is unprecedented. This is unpre it is. I've never seen anything like this. I think most people have never seen anything like this. And again, I did a video, a standalone video about people kind of coming down hard on the government. It's like, there is no model for this. Things are changing so fast, they're reacting on the fly. It's, you can't say, well, you know, they're not following the rule book because there isn't one for this kind of thing. They've run models in the past about what would happen. But there's so many little variables which I don't think were anticipated. You can say, well, this is how we, you know, this is a medical response to it. You know, we need this many beds, we need this many people on the street, we need the army to keep order, etc., etc., etc. But the, the the millions and millions of financial things, little knock-on effects, which you probably couldn't model because it's so intricate business and finances and everything. It's, there's such a, a vast array of things that I think, personally, I think they're doing a really good job in an extremely fluid situation. So, anyway, let's move on. Story number four. I'm conflicted on this one. Let's see what you think. Okay, so this is uh, Reuters via MSN News. Eat it. Hanoi chef prepares, uh, spreads joy with a Corona burger. So from the picture you can see there, they're actually the buns. That's the top of the burger bun. There's a better picture on the site, but that was my kind of top thing. So uh, you've got to eat it to beat it. That's the philosophy of one Hanoi chef who is attempting to boost morale in the Vietnamese capital by selling green Corona-themed burgers. Laughing in the face of the global pandemic, chef 
Wang Tung and his team now spend their days molding dozens of green tea stained burger buns, complete with little crowns made of dough to resemble the microscopic images of the virus. Uh, we have this joke that if you're scared of something, you should eat it, said Tung, uh, at the pizza home takeaway shop in downtown Hanoi. That's why the coronavirus isn't scary anymore. After you eat a burger in the shape of the virus itself, that way of thinking spreads joy to others during this pandemic. The shop has sold around 50 burgers a day, despite the growing number of businesses in Vietnam which have been forced to close because of the virus. In mid-February, Vietnam, Vietnam said all known uh, 16th at the time, COVID-19 cases at the time, had, uh, had recovered, but that changed after an influx of overseas visitors and returning Vietnamese citizens brought uh, an uptick in cases. There are now 148 recorded cases of the virus in Vietnam, but no reported deaths and I think that speaks to a lot here. According to the health ministry, um, authorities in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City have ordered that all non-essential businesses should close, although some food outlets, including Tung's Takeaway Shop, are still open. Uh, taking his grandson out for a corona burger, uh, Dang Di Chu, 66, uh, viewed the luminous green burger as a morale-boosting treat. Said this coronavirus is very dangerous, but if we eat a burger in its shape, in our minds, it's like we're already victorious. Uh, if you want to beat it, you've got to eat it first. Okay, so here's my issue with this. I can see why they're doing it. I can see they're trying to sort of take some of the fear away from it. And you know, it's 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 a as far as I can, it's a bit of fun. You know, you, the virus is horrible. This is your way of kind of getting back at it, and it's no longer scary. I think that attitude is is okay and it's been fine and it's been tolerated by locals in that area because there's so far been no deaths i think if people start to die from it then it will suddenly become distasteful maybe that's me viewing it from this side of things but imagine if they did that over here in the uk or anywhere and i'm not saying you know just because it's vietnam i'm saying because they currently have don't have any deaths if that was a place let's imagine in italy if they started doing it there is so many people affected by it. And if you were one of those people affected, if you lost a loved one, or if you had it yourself and really suffered with it, would you see this as kind of trivializing it a little bit? I don't know, I'm a, I'm a little bit, because I looked at it and I'm like, yeah, it's kind of cute. And then you think, yeah, but if, if that virus has taken people from you and then you see somebody doing it to make light of it or to make profit from it would you think that's distasteful or would you kind of think well you know it's bringing other people i mean it's i suppose it's very individual but for me i'm kind of like yeah it's, you know i get i get why they're doing it you know and i applaud people trying to make other people feel good during this time but i don't know there's something you know i've got an incredibly dark sense of humor but having sort of run this channel for a little bit it's i'm finding more and more I'm kind of questioning my own humour a little bit and so yeah maybe previous me would just go yeah it's just a bit of fun but now that I've got more perspective on the world because I'm reading a lot more news and getting a lot more kind of human stories where people are like this affects us this is bad you know this shouldn't be toyed with this shouldn't be joked about then maybe that's it maybe it is a bit like I say I'm kind of okay with it because in that area they've not had any deaths so it doesn't seem as disrespectful maybe from this guy's perspective Yet, because to him, the virus, you know, is, it's not killed anyone yet in that particular region. So maybe it is just, you know, people are getting sick, but they're getting better. So this is your chance to kind of get your own back. If you've had the virus and you've got better, come into my shop, buy one, eat it, feel good about yourself. You've, you've, you've beat it and now you've eaten it. Okay, I get that. But I think it would be different. And I think people would react to this different if there'd been a high death count, like I say, if this was done in Italy or Spain or the UK now or the US or anywhere that's having to suffer with this, I think it would be viewed as a bit more poor taste. I'm not sure. Anyway, I'll leave that one there. Let's move on. Story number five. So finish with just something lighthearted. This is from Variety. Ryan Reynolds and Torch is starring a Dragon's Lair film adaptation for Netflix. So I bring this up because I remember the Dragon's Lair game and it was just the worst it was the hardest game anyway he's in talks to star in it and produced a live action feature adaptation of the 80s arcade game dragon's Lair for netflix um roy lee will produce through his vertigo entertainment with trevor engelson of underground films don bluth gary goldman and john pomeroy are also producing so reynolds will produce this through his maximum effort production company uh 
Dan and Kevin Hageman, Hageman, whose credits include the Lego movie Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark are attached to write the script. Um, so, you know, they've had some big movies. Dragon's Lair put players in the shoes of Dirk the Daring as he attempted to rescue Princess Daphne from the Dragon Singe and the Wizard Mordrock. Okay. Dragon's Lair was originally released for arcades in 1983 by Cinematronics. The game used laser disc technology and offered superior graphics and feature film quality animation from Don Bluth Studio. So, yeah, if you ever played this, if you ever saw this, and you can watch like playthroughs on YouTube. It played like a very, very well done animated movie. At the time, kind of uh, Don Bluth, the, the Bluth Studios, were very much like quality wise, they were on a par with Disney, and something happened and Bluth kind of went down. But they did some fantastic animated movies. And the game, it was like superior graphics, it was essentially a movie on a laser disc. And you, um, you didn't control Dirk. There would be an animation, and then there would be a flash. And at a flash, you had to choose an action for Dirk. You had to choose the direction he would move, or like a, a swipe of his sword or something. And if you got it wrong, the animation cut immediately to him dying a horrible death. And you got to this a lot. A huge amount. And if you got it right, then he would perform the action. It might, you might leap to a ledge that was collapsing. You might over a pit of this, and you might swipe at these, with these green tentacle things with eyeballs in. And it was just the hardest game. Um, yeah, so Reynolds is obviously best known for the two Deadpool movies recently. He teamed with Netflix on the action movie Six Underground, which he was directed by Michael Bay, and he's been shooting uh, Red Notice with Gal Gadot and uh, Dwayne Johnson, also for Netflix. Uh, he's also starring in The Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard, so sequel to The Hitman's Bodyguard with Samuel L. Jackson and Salma Hayek returning. So Dragon's Lair would mark the third recent video game related project for Reynolds, because he did uh, Pokemon Tech to Pikachu, and this summer, maybe, uh, Free Guy, if you watch the trailer for Free Guy, it looks really good actually. It kind of looks Lego Movie-esque actually, where he's like, essentially he's like, he's in a video game and, you know, he but he's not aware of it kind of thing. So he just accepts that every day people around him get killed and you know, there's car crash and explosions and things. It's quite a funny trailer, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the movie. Um, yeah, so Vertigo, who was helping out, was uh, founded in 2002. Uh, that was Lee, what's his name? Roy Lee, founded Vertigo in 2002. His credits include The Ring, The Grudge, The It movies, and The Lego franchise, and the Best Picture winner, Departed. So there is some, you know, there's some real talent behind this. Um, and Engelson was a producer on Snowfall. Um, the Hagemans, or Hagemans, I, I get, I, apologies, are currently the showrunners and executive producers of Nickelodeon's Star Trek animated series. So there is a lot of talent behind this. There are a lot of people with pedigree behind this. But again, for me, it's more just the fact that this was a video game that I was, uh, kind of grew up with. The original Dragon's Lair, I didn't play that often. I was a huge fan of the follow-up. Uh, Dragon's Lair Time Warp, it was called. Um, and I had it on the Amiga, on the home system, and it was about eight floppy disks, floppy disks, remember? And again, it was cutscenes and cutscenes and cutscenes, and Princess Daphne, and that was my first crush. I was about eight or nine at the time. Um, yeah, and it was just such a hard game. And I remember the first play, I think it took about 45 or 46 moves to actually finish the game. And again, it was, you'd get a little animation, there'd be a, a flash, and it's like, in that flash, in that second, half a second, you had to decide what you were going to do, what, where you were going to send Dirk, and if you didn't send it right, you died. And that animation of him coming up as a skeleton, and then like a flash, and, and the skin appears on his face. I must have seen that 500 times. <laughs> So yeah, it'd be interesting to see what they do with the um, movie because the the game had a very it was very tongue in cheek. It was very kind of light hearted, had a very light tone to it, you know. And there were some interesting characters and loads of good voice work and that. But it was it was almost kind of like the animated Alice in Wonderland. It was really kind of playful. So are they going to do that in the film, or is it going to go a bit more, well, people like Game of Thrones, so let's make it dark and green. I hope they stick to the kind of the the, um, the themes of the game, because I think something light-hearted, with, uh, again, with Reynolds attached to it, I think would just work really well. So Anyway, we'll see. Nice light one to finish on. So that's it, guys. The links to all the stories I've discussed can be found in the description below, so feel free to go and check them out. Let me know what you think about this video, and tell me any video game you would like to see adapted. Adapted? Adapted to a movie. Now, stay away from the typical ones. So, I don't want to hear Bioshock, and I don't want to hear um, Halo. Because you always say, I want a Halo movie, I want a Bioshock movie. Yeah, we know. We all do. 
so I want to buy a movie. But outside of that, anything that may be obscure that you might think that would make a really good movie. Anyway, answer in the comments, please, along with your thoughts you'd like to share. These are mine. They're not necessarily important. They're not necessarily right or wrong. They're just what was on my mind. So until next time, bye for now.